When I was 13, the dawning of a new millennium took place on New Year's Eve. While people were fearing the worst with the Y2K bug or out partying and drinking, I was home all alone. In 1996, my parents had split up, and from there they were divorced. My mother and I moved across the country from Oregon to Tennessee with her best friend. On the eve of the year 2000, I was home alone, and my mother was currently out of state. This didn't worry me, as this wasn't the first time. I often came home to find a note on the kitchen counter, saying that they had gone to Florida for a few days and that there were groceries in the fridge. Since the divorce, she was regularly leaving me alone for long periods of time to go out to Florida. We lived on a relatively quiet road, surrounded by trees and set a few miles out of town. I knew most of the people, if not by name, then by face, enough to wave and have a small chat with. I had never before been given a reason to be afraid of being alone. On the night in question, I was staying up late watching television. I remember I was watching the movie His Bodyguard on USA Channel, and had most of the lights on in the house. Not because I was afraid, but because at 13, I wasn't concerned with electricity bills or saving the environment. I felt completely safe and protected within my little bubble of home. As I was watching the movie, I kept hearing these weird noises outside. I remembered thinking that it was probably the neighbors. Although they weren't extremely close, a couple of them were having a party and people over for the holiday. About halfway into the movie, however, the power in the house suddenly went dead. I sat on the couch for a minute, sort of in a panicked daze, because it was near midnight and now pitch black. I remembered thinking that the power must have gone out, and that surely it would come back on. I decided to sit on the couch with my blanket and wait. A few minutes passed by, when I heard a noise in the kitchen where the back door is. My heart started racing in my chest, because I thought it sounded like the back door being shut. The back door sits just off the dining room, which is connected to the kitchen, which leads directly into the living room where I was currently sitting on the couch. A few seconds passed after I heard the sound, and I was straining my ears to pick up anything that wasn't supposed to be there. Suddenly, every noise felt magnified. When footsteps sounded on the floor, I immediately slithered off the couch onto all fours, crawled around the ottoman, and started as slowly and as quietly as I could to make my way towards the space between the love seat and the couch. I knew I could fit under the side table and be completely hidden by the dark in the ottoman from playing hide-and-go-seek in the dark many, many times with my friends during sleepovers. I was nearly there when the footsteps became all the more apparent. I knew from the sound of them that whoever it was was making their way through the kitchen now toward the living room. They weren't in a hurry or anything. It was like they were just moving around in their own home. I glanced up from where I was crouched on the floor. To my horror, there was a dark silhouette standing in the archway between the two rooms. To my credit, I didn't scream. However, I did panic. I stood up immediately to my feet from my hiding spot and ran down the hallway. I believe the only reason I wasn't overcome was because the person chasing me had to get around the ottoman in the dark to follow me. I did what all children do when they're afraid. I ran past the front door, the guest bedroom, the bathroom, and ran to the farthest door down the hallway, my room. In all honesty, I probably wouldn't have even been able to get the front door unlocked and open in time, as it was right off to the side of the couch. When I was ten, I had gotten a bird for my birthday. He was a blue-fronted Amazon, and I named him Boo, because it was October and close to Halloween. Boo had a large iron cage. It could have been metal, but very large, sturdy, and about six feet tall. And it was kept in my room, despite the fact that Boo, like me, pretty much had the run of the house whenever he wanted. 
This information will become relevant later in the story. As I ran into the room, I slammed the door shut and locked it. However, the lock was simply one of those little turn knobs that you can easily pop with a butter knife. I had barely gotten the door shut and locked when the person on the other side knocked on it. I have no idea why they knocked, if they did it to just mock me or to scare me, but I knew in my heart that that little lock was not going to keep whoever it was on the other side out of my room. It couldn't even keep my mother out when we were arguing, and it wouldn't stand up to any brute force. I was panicking, on the verge of tears, when the person started laughing. It was low and quiet, and because of that, it was even more frightening. It wasn't a manic laughter, but as if someone were genuinely amused. It was the laughter that really frightened me, and I started heavily and hysterically crying. I looked around the room to figure out what I could do. That was when I realized Boo's cage would fit almost perfectly between the door and the wall of my closet. The cage moved quietly on my carpeted floor, but as I pushed it into place, it scraped against the door and alerted whoever it was on the other side that I was trying to barricade myself in. Suddenly, they threw themselves at my door, and you could hear the sound of the wood splintering and the door handle being twisted violently. Boo, who had been stirred awake by the movement, began literally screaming and flapping his wings. I might have screamed with him, but honestly, I don't remember. I just remember being extremely scared. Terrified, I crawled under my bed slash couch, a bunk bed with a futon on the bottom, and waited. Several minutes passed by, and the person eventually stopped attacking my door. Boo continued to scream even after he had stopped. Though being under my bed gave me no feelings of being secure, I didn't come out from under it because I simply had nowhere else to go. I thought about trying to sneak out to the window, but I was afraid he might expect it and be there waiting for me on the other side. It was also several feet off the ground, as the house was built on a raised foundation. I remember laying under my bed, terrified for what felt like hours. I must have fallen asleep, because when I awoke the next morning, it was already daylight. The fear of what had happened came back to me as soon as I registered where I was and why, and scared that whoever had been in my house might still be there. I decided to crawl out the window and run to a neighbor's house, since it was daylight outside and therefore I felt less afraid. Crawling out a window is a lot harder than it looks, and I did it less than gracefully. I was, and still am not, the most coordinated human being. Once I was back on my feet, however, I carefully made my way around the house, and that's when I noticed that the back door was a wide open. Scared, but feeling a little braver now that I was outside, and that it was morning instead of pitch black night, I walked up the back steps and peered inside. Seeing nothing out of the ordinary, I decided to go in. Looking back, I cringe on how stupid this could have turned out, and that I wish I could have told my younger self to make the smarter move and go get help, but thankfully the man was no longer inside the house. I did a terrifying, heart-pounding room-to-room check, looking in all the closets and under all the beds, behind the couch, anywhere I thought even the smallest child might be able to fit. I even popped the lock on my mom's bedroom so I could check it, and then relocked it afterwards. When I was positive there was no one there, I went back to lock the back door and noticed that the breaker box on the opposite wall was open. The main switch had been pulled. I flipped it back on, locked both locks on the back door, checked all the windows and front door, and then called my mom. Once again, I broke down crying hysterically. She called the co-worker, who came and stayed the entire day with me as they drove back. My mom still took random trips to Florida after that, but she always took me with her from then onward. So, terrifying crazy person that broke into my house on New Year's Eve, please let's never meet again. I sincerely hope no other young girl had to meet you either. 
I don't know if you were just some drunk visitor of a neighbor, but you terrorized me that night. I was afraid of being alone when my mom was working, and to this day I still get scared when I'm all alone. I overthink what I would do if someone came inside, and how I could hide. When my cats make noise out of nowhere, I immediately investigate for fear that it's someone trying to get in once again. First time posting on Reddit, I had a strange unsolved experience as a kid that's been on my mind quite a lot lately, and I decided this is the right place to share. The first half of this story takes place on Halloween of 1991. A quick bit of background, I was a seven-year-old boy at the time, and my sister was only a few months old. I lived in Long Island, New York, on the border area of the town that kind of acted as an unspoken separation between the more affluent area and the lower income hood type areas. My dad owned a bar across from the train station that was extremely popular in the 80s and was still riding the tail end of that boom. My father did very well for himself. My father and his business were well known around town. I think this may have something to do with what had happened. He eventually squandered everything on a heroin addiction, but that's a different story. And for the record, I had nothing but love and respect for him, despite all of his flaws. So, it was Halloween. My mom was working the night shift at my dad's bar. My sister was home with a teenage babysitter. My dad had taken me and my friend trick-or-treating. This was the first year I was able to go out at night, so I was super stoked. When we got home, though, there were cops at my house. The babysitter was crying, and my mom had already come home. Earlier, while the sitter was alone with my sister, she got a phone call from an unknown woman, asking specifically for me. She had told the person I wasn't there, and the woman stated that she had a gift for me, and that she would call back. This woman had called back a few times, saying something similar, and she began to insist that she was going to come and deliver her gift personally. Eventually, she called and said to look in the mailbox. That was when the sitter called the police. The police found a pirate skull Halloween decoration that would talk and shake when you clapped, as well as several candy bars. My whole family was really bugged out about this. I was scared, but I also kind of liked the skull thing and convinced my parents after much protest to let me keep it. My parents, for a few weeks after that, were on edge and hated the toy. They tried to work with the police, but there wasn't much they could do, and the whole thing kind of just went cold. Fast forward to the following summer, 1992. My best friend and I decided to have a car wash in front of his house, which was diagonally across the street from mine. We had out buckets, soap, a hose, and a sign. You get the picture. Suddenly, this black car rolls up. It was an old 80s Crown Vic or something that looked like it. One of those big cars that steers like a boat. The car rolls down the window, and there's a woman sitting in the driver's seat. She had short white hair, kind of had this whole Ursula vibe going on. I told my parents at the time that she was old because of the hair, but looking back, she probably had been as young as her 40s. She says to me, Hi, my name. Do you know who I am? I told her no. Suddenly, she says, I'm the one who gave you those nice presents on Halloween. My jaw dropped and I froze, just staring. Then, like something straight out of a movie, she began to laugh maniacally, and after a moment sped off. I ran home and told my parents. That was the end of it, and they never figured out who it was. My father had speculated that this person may have believed he was wealthy, and maybe was trying to get a ransom or something. Maybe she was a scorned ex-lover. I don't know, I've speculated many things, but
but we'll likely never know at this point. I'm now 35, and that was all a lifetime ago. Sorry if this was an underwhelming payoff at the end, but it's bugged me for years, and I wanted to share it. In the past year, I've had several of my dad's old friends find and reach out to me on Facebook. My dad and I have a very similar face, and the same name, so I was easy to find. Two of them are women. One of them made me a little uncomfortable because she kept pushing to hang out, and she's a lot older than me. Not like a casual hangout, like a go-to-the-bar hangout. I said no, of course, but she started to ask a lot of personal questions. And that's what brought the story back to the forefront of my mind. I'm getting a weird feeling in my gut that this woman is the same woman that stalked me as a child. That thought gives me a chill, but I would really like to know for sure who this person was and why they had even stalked me. Hi everyone. So lately I've had some requests to finally share the whole story of the homeless man I accidentally took in as a tenant and the incidents that followed. I'm just saying in advance, this is a long one, but every detail is relevant. Although everything I've documented is factual, the case was never solved and has likely gone cold, since this happened more than 10 years ago. So, back in 2007, I found myself working as a bartender at a now-closed pub in my hometown. Not a job I particularly liked, but it paid the bills. At this time, they had hired a new kitchen manager that we all simply knew as Kearney. Kearney was a pleasant enough man, mostly keeping to himself, but he always stayed late to help the barmen do our closing duties, so we all liked him for that. New in town, Kearney had yet to find a place of permanent residence, and I had recently lost my tenants, so someone suggested he ask me. He was considerably older than the tenants I usually took in, but having a streak of bad luck with tenants my own age, I thought an older man with a nice steady job may be a shift in the right direction, so I agreed. Kearney wasted no time and followed me home that very same night, only he wasn't alone. Enter Lawrence, the boyfriend of Kearney. Honestly, I hadn't even realized he was gay up to that point but it was water off my back regardless. Looking back now, what really should have bothered me though was Lawrence's appearance. He looked like he had been sleeping on the street, rather appropriately as I would later find out. So, Kearney moved in. Lawrence was there a lot too, and it was easy to know when due to his mobile ringtone sounding like the quacking of a duckling. Kearney had some habits, that were rather noteworthy to this story. In particular, he basically never closed his bedroom door, no matter what he was doing in there. It was always open, and although he was a very heavy smoker, he never once smoked inside the house. So Kearney had been living there for about two weeks, when I had come down with an awful case of pink eye. This being highly contagious, I was given leave of absence from my bartending job, and therefore decided to go wait it out at my sister's for a few days. Apparently, I didn't mind giving it to her. Sorry, sis. So the day that my sister was scheduled to come pick me up, I couldn't drive yet at the time. I took a casual stroll into the bar that myself and Ben, my good friend from high school, and at the time co-worker, had been building in my house. Something caught my eye. All of our liquor bottles were completely empty. Now, those who had been frequenting my house at the time would know that we weren't just talking about one or two bottles of brandy here, but bottles of whiskey, gin, vodka, schnapps, liqueurs, and basically, it was a fully stocked bar that could host a pretty big party without requiring much in the way of additions. So I called Kearney in, asking him what he knew about this, receiving feedback that Lawrence and him had been on a slight drinking binge, 
Those were the actual words he used. That left me both furious about the thousands of dollars worth of stock they had drunk, but also slightly impressed that he was still alive somehow. Regardless, I said that I would be dealing with this upon my return. So I'm with my sister for a few days, and on Friday got a call from my local police department asking me if I know a Conrad Schultz. Ironically enough, I didn't. And they finally add that I'll probably know him as Kearney, and that I should probably come down to the station right away. They had just arrested his boyfriend, trying to sell my camera equipment. My sister rushes me back home, where all my camera equipment was on display at the police station. It's on this visit that I'm informed that Lawrence was actually a Navy SEAL, who got dishonorably discharged, before turning to a life of crime. He had a rap sheet the length of the Bible. The kicker was that both he and Kearney were actually homeless men, who had met at the Salvation Army. So Lawrence is in jail, and my sister drops me off at home, more or less at the same time Kearney gets home as well. Based on Kearney's account of what happened, he had turned Lawrence in himself, as he couldn't allow Lawrence to do to me what he was trying to. Although I had appreciated his sacrifice, I still told Kearney that he would have to go, having been the overall cause of all of this. However, not wanting to leave a homeless man, well, homeless, I gave him until the end of the month to make other arrangements. So Monday comes, and having just completed a staff meeting, I walk home to encounter a very much free Lawrence, sitting on the sidewalk across from my house, watching it. I confront Lawrence as to why he's there, and he tries to apologize before begging for some money. Rather out of character for him, really. I dismissed him without giving him a cent. Now I go back to the previous night. See, I had mentioned the staff meeting for a reason, as it was at that meeting where we had all gotten a rather sizable list of liquor bottles that had gone missing from the storeroom, leaving us all suspecting each other. I, however, would not have long to wait to figure out who the real culprit was, as a few days later, I opened the garbage bin in my kitchen to see all of the missing bottles, empty and staring back at me. I decided to sit on this information for the time being, although I did photograph it just in case if I needed for evidence later. I had also called over Ben to inform him of the developments. As this was quickly becoming a detective game, we decided to enter Kearney's room to search for further evidence. Nothing of vast significance in there with one exception. Two single photographs of Lawrence, before he had turned into the homeless version of Lex Luthor or Charles Xavier. Actually, there were several of Lawrence's things in there, but as Lawrence had spent a lot of time there before the incident, I accepted this as normal. I should also add that I had mentioned Lawrence's release to Kearney, and I told them that if I even suspected they were still seeing each other, I would throw him out of the house myself. Only a few days would pass before this came into play. On this particular night, I had been bartending again, and Kearney had constantly been stopping by the bar to help himself to draft glasses half full of wine and half full of coke, which he would go drink outside the restaurant. We confronted him about this, but as he correctly pointed out, he was still a manager and we had no right to tell him what he could or could not do. On his fourth trip, however, I had grown suspicious and decided to follow him outside. I encountered Lawrence sitting outside, sharing the concoctions with Kearney. This pissed me off, so the next day I returned to the restaurant with my photographic evidence. I handed it over to the general manager, who was also kind of a friend of mine. Although I hadn't physically seen it, I had heard the confrontation through the office door when he fired Kearney. Kearney laughed obviously upset and apparently had no idea that I had been the one who turned him in. So we had closed early that night, and I was walking home going past the high school. I saw Kearney coming from the opposite direction. He walked past me, literally only saying two words, I'm scared, before disappearing into the darkness. That would be the last time that I would ever physically lay my eyes on Conrad Schultz, 
so we reached the final week before Kearney's eviction was to take place. Ben had come to stay with me for that duration, as we both wanted to monitor the situation and make sure that nothing else crazy happened. It was in this week that Kearney's behavior suddenly changed. He was constantly smoking in his room, and his door was closed 24-7. In fact, neither Ben nor I had caught so much as a peek of him in that entire week. We hadn't thought much of it at the time. So the day of Kearney's eviction comes around. Ben had gone home for a few hours, and I finally hear Kearney's bedroom door open. Someone walks out of the room, opens the front door, and leaves. I follow him outside, but somehow he had already completely disappeared. And what was left, though, was his house keys indicating that he obviously wasn't planning on coming back. I took a look at the keys, noticing something strange. Although the correct keys were all on the keychain, there were also several that weren't mine. Why would he leave me the wrong keys? I remember myself thinking this as I walked into his room. His room was a shock, not because of the state it was in, the two had broken his bed in an act of wild monkey sex, but I had known about that already. But more that he had literally left almost all of his belongings behind. With one exception. You guessed it. The two photos of Lawrence. Upon further investigation, I suddenly realized that all traces of Lawrence ever being there had completely vanished, with all of Kearney's stuff left behind. There was one thing of Lawrence left behind, though. His duckling ringtone, which it turned out hadn't been so much a ringtone as an actual duckling, which now strolled around casually in the vacant bedroom. We named him Neville. So Ben returns and gets updated about the developments, both of us thinking that the way he left was rather weird. Of course, this whole situation had been weird. It was only when I asked the infamous question that this all became a conspiracy theory. Hey, did you ever actually see Kearney in this last week? It was to our shock that we realized that neither of us ever had. Suddenly putting puzzle pieces together, and the changing habits, Neville the Duck, the wrong keys, only Lawrence's stuff being gone. It was with great discomfort that we both asked the question, who had really been living in our house this last week? During the next few days, Ben and I went on a mission, searching the town, crawling into drain pipes, trying to find any trace of Kearney's whereabouts. They all added up to nothing. Conrad Schultz had simply vanished off the face of the earth. That wasn't the case with Lawrence, though. He was still around, having made some new homeless friends. We encountered him several times begging on the streets. I would ask him every time, Where's Kearney, Lawrence? But he acted like he had never heard of him. The last time I would see Lawrence was across from work, attempting to break into a car. I had called the police on him, and they had arrived rather quickly, arresting him on the spot. While he was being led away by the police, I shouted after him one last time. Where is Kearney, Lawrence? But he just ignored me and let the cops take him away. The next day, I filed a police report, reporting Kearney as a missing person, and suggesting that Lawrence may know something about it, but nothing ever came of it. For those asking if anything ever came of the case, unfortunately not. I should probably add that South Africa has a unique way of closing cases, as in, after a month or two, they just send you a text saying, case closed due to lack of evidence. I didn't get one in this case, but did get one in an armed robbery which I fell victim to back in 2017, so I'm not too hopeful that they did too much effort here. Regarding Lawrence, I saw him one more time after getting arrested. He was only locked up for about a week. After that, though, he disappeared. I'm not sure if he just left town or what. I posted once before about a break-in when I was a teenager. I decided to post again about another creepy experience. My husband and I love to go driving. 
We prefer road trips, but on the weekends or nights when we have nothing better to do, we go cruising and just drive around a bit. We prefer smooth and not busy roads. On this particular night, we were a bit bored and decided to go cruising. We went up north to a small town, about half an hour from the city where the roads are curvy and smooth. This town is close to the mountains, and if you follow this particular main street all the way up north, it starts driving up to a mountain. It's about 9 p.m., and there are very few cars in the roads already, since it's a little cute town. But we keep going north away from the houses and stores, and eventually to where the roads start curving uphill. We drive for about 15 minutes more, and it's pitch black, when we see some blinking lights. As we get closer, we see that a truck is on the side of the road facing us. I'm getting the chills thinking about being all the way out here in the middle of nowhere and a stranded truck on the side of the road. As he slowly approaches closer, I tell my husband it's probably for the best to turn back. I had a bad feeling, but at this point we were pretty much next to the truck. As he pulls up next to it, a young blonde man, maybe in his late 20s, comes around and gets next to our window. I got such a bad vibe by this man, I told my husband not to put the window down. I think he also got a weird feeling, so we listened right away. He kind of just loudly asked through the window what's wrong. And the guy says something's wrong with his truck and that he might need a hand. His phone is dead. My husband asks what happened, but the man insists on showing him and says to come take a look. He says it very friendly and even calls him bro and says he's so glad we pulled up. My husband says, you know what, I won't be of much help. I know nothing about cars, but let me call someone. He knows a lot about cars. This guy is insisting and starts getting visibly upset. I'm looking back at the truck and I think I catch movement inside. I tell my husband I think we should go right now. He probably saw the look of fear on my face because he put the car in reverse, but as he did that, the man is now behind our car, acting stressed out, rubbing his face and pacing. My husband decides to go forward then. We drive up for maybe two minutes, trying to find a place to turn around since the road is so narrow. The road turns to dirt road, and there's a little more space on the side, so he was finally able to turn the car around. I was dreading going back that way now, and our phones had no signal at all. In my mind, I know that this could all be really someone with car problems. Maybe a friend is just in the truck, too. He never said he was alone. I just can't help the bad feeling in my gut. We soon reached the area where the truck had been, but now there's no truck at all. We drive down maybe another five minutes, but no trace of the truck, and we're sure we'd pass the place where it had been. Like I said, we didn't drive up too far to begin with. I'm both relieved and terrified that the truck was no longer there. If it had really broken down and they couldn't fix it, how did they get it to work again in such a short time? Calming myself down, I'm telling my husband, Hey, maybe they really did get it to work. Maybe it just turned on all of a sudden and they were able to drive off. A bit suspicious, but not impossible. As we keep driving through and the roads are straightening out, we notice far off the truck with all of its lights off parked to the side again. We notice movement coming from the bed of the truck. I say out loud, why did they turn off all the lights? I think they thought we were still too far away to see them, but we see two figures get on the other side of the truck and crouch down, as if hiding. We get closer, and my husband floors it. As we drive past, two men get up, one of them the man we had spoken to, and someone else, both with a very surprised look on their faces. One of them runs behind us for a bit, and we see them get tinier in the back. I kept looking back, terrified, but it was dark back there now. All of a sudden, I see the headlights of the truck turn on and start driving our direction very fast. My husband kept going as fast as possible, 
and eventually we lost the headlights. I keep looking back the rest of the way, so scared that they're somehow still following us. Maybe they had turned off their lights again and I couldn't see them. After driving for a very long time back to the city, we convince ourselves that we lost them. We do call the non-emergency line and give a description of what we saw. No, we didn't get the plates of the truck. It was all so fast and in all the fear I didn't think to get them. We just gave a description of the guy we saw, the type of truck it was, but there was really nothing that could be done. I realize all this could be rationalized, but in the moment we were filmed with terror, being out there in the middle of nowhere. They could have been armed. They could have put their truck sideways and left us with nowhere to go. They could have put something out on the road to rip up our tires. Even though it could all have some explanation, there's still so many questions. Why couldn't he tell us what was wrong? How did the truck work again so fast? Why did they hide? It's been about a year now, and this is just a creepy experience now. We still go cruising, but usually we just stick to a little more civilized areas, at least for the nighttime cruises. <laughs>